Uh, good evening to you all. I'll, uh, I'll start. Uh, 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 so far, the U. To English, if you don't mind. So. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. In the name of Allah, most merciful, most gracious, I welcome their uh, excellencies, uh, Samah, Tony, and the other colleagues, the foreign ministers of the United Arab Emirates and Qatar and Saudi Arabia, uh, and the uh, Secretary General of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Uh, at this uh, hardship, at this extremely difficult time, a time that uh, uh, should reflect that uh, reflect our interest to protect our peoples from the uh, destruction of war and to work together uh, continuously to stop this uh, uh, disaster that erupted on the 7th of October and actually uh, evolved into the war that Israel is uh, raging against Gaza. And our speech today was uh, honest, was direct, was comprehensive, and uh, in depth and with all transparency, it has reflected the Arab and the U.S. Uh, stances in what is uh, should be done immediately to end this catastrophe, but it ascertained also the uh, mutual uh, 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 keenness to our uh, uh, our involvement actually to stop what we can describe as a catastrophe that will haunt the region for generations and we all want just and comprehensive peace on the basis of the two-state solution as a path for ensuring the security of the region of the Palestinians of the Israelis and the peoples of the region and also there were uh, points of meeting and these uh, uh, points of agreement between the U.S. and the stances that the Arab foreign ministers have actually expressed. And these points uh, included the, uh, to, uh, the importance of, uh, uh, of delivering humanitarian assistance, uh, enough humanitarian assistance to Gaza and protecting civilians, the importance of abundance to the uh, international humanitarian law and the international law, and the rejection of the displacement uh, uh, of Palestinians of their land. And as we said before, uh, at the Arab League and we in Jordan and all the Arab countries, we consider that this is a war crime that we will stop with all our strengths. The Arab countries, the Arab world do demand an immediate ceasefire that will end this war and end the killing of the innocent and the destruction it is causing. And we don't accept that it is a self-defense, it is a ranging war that is killing civilians, destroying their homes, their hospitals, their schools, their mosques, and their churches. It cannot be justified under any pretext, and it will not bring Israel security, it will not bring the region peace. The killing uh, must stop, and uh, also Israel uh, 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 immuning, uh, immune from uh, committing uh, uh, war crimes must stop. And uh, please allow me now to switch to English and speak. We cannot allow this war to undermine all that has been done to bring about just peace to the region. With every missile unleashed on Gaza, with every killing of a Palestinian child, and Israel has killed in this war more children than all global conflicts did since 2019. The whole region is sinking in a sea of hatred that will define uh, generations to come. Uh, that is already starting to manifest itself uh, in expressions and acts of hatred in the region, and uh, to be honest, in the deplorable acts and expressions of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. And, and that's something that we all stand against unequivocally, unequivocally, on principle, and in accordance with our human values. 
Uh, this is not a religious war. It's not a war between Muslims and Jews. This is defined in its context, and all our values, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, all other human values, uh, uh, dictate that we work for peace and we stop this madness, and we do not allow for, or for the uh, very dangerous dehumanization that we see. Uh, rage cannot and should not be allowed to destroy the lives of millions of people. We understand that there is pain. Nobody in their right mind will belittle the pain that was felt by Israelis on October 7, and that's being felt by Palestinians and all of us. It doesn't matter who we are, Arab, Muslims, Christian, Jews, human beings. Uh, that pain cannot be belittled, but again, we cannot allow rage uh, to determine where we go forward. We condemn the killing of all civilians. We condemn the killing of Palestinian civilians. We condemn the killing of Israeli civilians on October 7, and before and after, regardless of, of nationality, as I said. Uh, we're extremely worried uh, on this our situation in, on the West Bank. Uh, again, killing and, and uh, violation of international law cannot continue there. Settlers should not be allowed to rampage Palestinian communities and kill innocents in the West Bank. Uh, Israeli soldiers who brought despicable humiliation to Palestinians after illegally uh, uh, detaining them should be held accountable. Palestinians and Israelis uh, deserve to live in peace, with dignity, with security, and freedom from occupation and freedom from fear. Only a just and lasting peace that fulfills the right of the Palestinian people to freedom their sovereign state, the East Jerusalem as their capital in June 4, 1967 lines, living side by side, a secure Israel will bring security to all. The priority now is to ending this war, uh, to saving innocent lives, to preventing further destruction, to restoring hope, and to stopping the very dangerous dehumanization. All lives matter to all of us. And uh, Mr. Secretary Tony, the U.S. has a leading role to play in these efforts. And on it, and on all of us, uh, fall the very heavy responsibility of ending this catastrophe, achieving the just peace that is the right of uh, every Palestinian, every Israeli, mother, child, father, and that will ensure that none of them or any other in the region will ever have to live the horrors that this vicious cycle of violence and war uh, is bringing. We will continue to work with you and with all our partners to fulfill this responsibility to make sure that our common human values prevail, international law prevails, and peace for all prevails. Thank you so much. So I now may give the floor to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me first say that I'm grateful to Majesty King Asdola, uh, to Prime Minister Tafari, Diamond, and his entire team for their hospitality, and for the opportunity to be with Prime Minister Shukri, and also with Prime Minister Khan, uh, Prime Minister Hani. Prime Minister Abdullah bin Zayed, and Secretary General Hussein al Um We appreciate the engagement of every country, and we're particularly grateful to Jordan and to Egypt, two partners who have long worked to advance the two-state solution, for their dedication to a more stable and to a more peaceful Middle East. We come together here today uh, sharing the same fundamental interest and objective end this conflict in a way that ensures lasting peace and security in the region. You may have different views and positions on certain necessary steps to achieve that objective. But today we reaffirm our individual commitments to continue to work toward that end and end that we share. Throughout this conflict, countries across the Middle East and beyond have played an essential role in preventing its spread. Today, we all agree on the importance of using our respective influence and capabilities to deter any state or non-state actor from opening another front in this conflict or taking other destabilizing actions. All of us have a direct interest in this. Our joint efforts have also been critical in increasing the flow of humanitarian assistance to Gaza. I'm particularly grateful to Egypt for its significant efforts 
to facilitate a mechanism with Israel and with the United Nations to do just that. Each day, more than 100 trucks are moving to Rafa, up from zero just a little over a week. But that is not nearly enough. Today, we spoke about ways to accelerate and expand the sustained delivery of aid. This morning, I had an opportunity to meet with Commissioner General Lazzarini uh, of UNRWA, and I spoke with UNRWA staff that is located in Gaza. I heard firsthand about the extraordinary life-saving work that they're doing in Gaza in the face of extremely difficult conditions, and how we can expedite efforts to get assistance to them so that they can get it to the Palestinian people. We're also working to continue the progress we've made in getting our citizens, other foreign nationals, critically wounded people out of Gaza. But even as we welcome their safe exit, we remain resolutely committed and focused on securing the release of hostages held by Hamas. I had the opportunity to discuss this, the status of our ongoing efforts with Prime Minister al Thani this morning. We all spoke today about the clear need to protect Palestinian civilians. The United States supports Israel's right to defense against Hamas. A terrorist organization that attacked it brutally, and that cares not a whit about the Palestinian people or their futures. This is the same right that each of our countries have. But as Israel conducts its campaign, how it does it matters. Israel must take every possible measure to prevent civilian casualties. In my meetings with Israeli officials yesterday, I conveyed additional steps they can and should take to do just that. Protecting civilians will help prevent Hamas from further exploiting the situation. But most important, it's simply the right and moral thing to do. When I see a Palestinian boy or girl pulled from the wreckage of a building, it hits me in the gut, just as it hits everyone's gut. And I see my own children in their faces. And as human beings, how can any of us not feel the same way? This morning I heard from the UNRWA staff in, in Gaza, many of whom are displaced themselves, about the immense human toll this conflict has taken. For UNRWA itself, they've lost 77 of their colleagues who are there simply trying to provide people with their basic needs. The trauma of being under constant bombardment and in constant danger. The inability to assure their own children that nothing will happen to them. What we have to do, more than anything else, all of us, everyone concerned, is to prevent the dehumanization of each other. If we don't do that, then we do exactly Hamas's work for it. So we have to look out for each other. We have to look out for every innocent life. Now, the United States believes that all of the, these efforts would be facilitated by humanitarian pauses. We believe pauses can be a critical mechanism for protecting civilians, for getting aid in, for getting foreign nationals out, while still enabling Israel to achieve the objective to defeat Hamas. Yesterday, I spoke in depth with Israeli leaders about how, when, and where such arrangements could be implemented, and what needs to be done to make them possible. Today, regional partners discuss many of the same questions. We're all deeply concerned about escalating extremist violence against Palestinian civilians in the West Bank. This has been a serious problem that's only worsened since the conflict. I updated ministers today on my discussion with the Israeli government yesterday where I underscored that excitement and extremist violence must be stopped and perpetrators must be held accountable. As we work together to address each of these immediate challenges, we also have to concurrently work to build secure and lasting peace. And for that to happen, we have to create the conditions to ensure that we do not find ourselves in the same place just weeks or months from now. We had substantial discussions today about our shared interest in creating the foundation for durable security and for enduring peace. The United States continues to believe that 
sole viable path is a two-state solution, with Israelis and Palestinians each in exercising their legitimate right to live in a state of their own, with equal measures, security, freedom, of opportunity, and dignity. And we discuss some of the meaningful and practical steps that we might take to help advance that proposition. Get us there. The United States and our partners will have different views on how best to advance or achieve these steps. But we all recognize that we cannot go back to the status quo. And we all understand that we not only have an interest, but a responsibility to do everything we can to chart a better path forward together. Now, none of us are under the illusion that this will be easy, particularly our partners from Egypt and Jordan who have for decades worked to facilitate a real peace. But it's precisely now, when the stakes are highest, even when the outlook seems darkest, that we have to intensify our work to meet the small. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, please My brother Ayman, my friend Tony, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank His Excellency uh, Mr. Ayman Sanfadi, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Experienced Affairs, ladies and gentlemen. Our meeting um, is to discuss the developments of the crisis in Gaza and give room for the Arab countries involved to express their positions toward this crisis. I was keen through this uh, meeting to explain the vision or the position of Egypt that our Arab brothers, and I stressed that we need to take time into consideration, consideration and look at the uh, development. The unfortunate killing events in Gaza cannot be justified. We would not accept to go into an argument or accept the justification of these practices as considered against the uh, or a right to de self-defense. The collective uh, punishment, Israel targeting innocent civilians and facilities, medical facilities, paramedics, in addition to trying to force immigration for Palestinians to leave the, their lands, this cannot be a legitimate self-defense at all. Egypt is exerting its all efforts to guarantee that uh, delivering aids to the Gaza Strip and help treating the uh, civilians uh, wounded, and we will continue our efforts in spite of all the obstacles we are facing. In this regard, I would like to uh, ask or for an, an immediate and intensive ceasefire in Gaza without any condition, and that Israel would stop what its, uh, its violations of the international law and the laws of war. And we need to double our work to deliver humanitarian aid uh, as soon as possible with quantities that would meet the, meet the needs of the Palestinians and would open space to talk later on how to come out of this crisis before it gets broader and the conflict would, uh, would inflict all the peoples of the region and go through a dark tunnel. I also reiterated that we should not deal with this crisis of international peace and security in a double standard where, while some are condemning, uh, targeting civilians and describing this as a gross violations of humanitarian law and to adhere to the demands of uh, ceasefire, while we find that they are opposed the same principles for the same people when things are related to the Palestinian cause, as if the Arab blood is lesser than the bloods of other people, although that the numbers of people who were killed from civilians in Gaza over the last few weeks, including 
working in relief and journalist cannot be justified any way. And in this regard, we are still asking for an immediate ceasefire and that Israel would stop hindering the delivery of humanitarian aid. And we also uh, demand an international investigation for these violations of the international law and this war. And finally, what we are witnessing of an exhalation and a human tragedy and suffering of civilians as a result of not uh, addressing the deep root of the problem and to, uh, uh, to address the rights of the Palestinian rights. I reject any attempts to liquidate like the Palestinian cause. And I ask that we need to work as soon as possible to revive the peace process based on the two-state solution and in the Israeli occupation and establish a Palestinian state based on the lines of uh, the 4th of July 19th uh, and its capital is Jerusalem. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Sameh. Uh, I'm sure the three of us would love to stay and answer all your questions, but we really have a very, very tight schedule still ahead of us. So we'll take this very, very limited number of questions, and I'd appreciate it if all our colleagues would just limit their, their intervention to one question and one question only. Sufyan, can you please? Thank you, Mahdi. Let's start with Khaled Al-Isa and Khaled Al-Mashar to ask. My question to Mr. Samih Shukriya. Perhaps today's meeting was at a very important time and attended by uh, the ministries of uh, foreign uh, affairs of important countries that are very influenced in the Palestinian cause. Do you feel that American, uh, the, the American administration uh, is able to stop the aggressions against civilians in the Gaza Strip? Or did the American side during this meeting has offered any roadmap or any map to resume the peace process or to push or end the, the current crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's inappropriate for me to talk about the uh, U.S. Uh, position in the presence of the U.S. Secretary of State. I believe uh, we had a very comprehensive and transparent conversation and uh, with countries that share the desire to work effectively to contain this crisis and to put uh, down the foundations and solutions that would spare the region from these uh, conflicts that uh, allows us also to talk uh, about and deal uh, with all issues uh, using the same measures and to protect civilians and uh, to ensure the flow of uh, humanitarian assistance and also to deal with the root causes of the um, uh, crisis, which is the failure to implement um, decades later um, the agreement to establish a two-state solution, uh, given that, that this would put an end to the conflict and uh, end the enmity between the two parties and uh, would mitigate uh, all the threats related to that. We always look forward uh, to work closely with the U.S. Uh, we have a strategic relationship with the U.S. and we appreciate uh, the capabilities available to the U.S. There was uh, interest and uh, very clear interest uh, that we reached and we will work in the future to translate these ideas and visions into a reality on the ground to contain this um, severe crisis and humanitarian crisis. All efforts should, uh, be, should come together and to work positively and end this conflict, not just even end this crisis, but also the root causes of the conflict. Simon Lewis, Reuters. Uh, 
Hi. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, one question, but uh, but I appreciate an answer from all of you, if possible. Um, to the Egyptian uh, and Jordanian ministers specifically, um, are you engaging in talks about the future of Gaza, a future of Gaza without Hamas, uh, and what role you can play in that future? And Secretary Blinken, um, you know, how do you respond to the calls for your, from your allies here for a ceasefire? Um, and and are, are you hearing, um, are you finding receptive uh, uh, ears for your calls to talk about um, Gaza after Hamas? Um, thanks very much for the question. Uh, it's our view that uh, a ceasefire now would simply leave Hamas in place, able to regroup and repeat what it did on October 7th. And you don't have to take my word for it. Just a few days ago, a senior Hamas official said that it was their intent to do October 7th again and again and again. No nation, none of us, can accept that. No one would find that hollow. Uh, and so it is important to reaffirm Israel's right to defend itself, indeed its obligation to do so, and to take necessary steps so that October 7th can never happen again. But it's also very important the way Israel does that. And that's what we've talked to the Israeli government about, uh, with taking every possible measure to protect human life, to prevent civilian casualties, as well as to ensure that those who are in need have the assistance that they need. To that end, I think we all shared deep concern about the plight of civilians uh, in Gaza, men, women, and children who need most essential thing uh, to get by. Uh, we've worked very hard to make sure that that assistance can flow to them. Uh, but it's also one of the reasons why humanitarian pause would be so important, to make sure that we can maximize the assistance getting to uh, the Palestinians, that we can make sure that people can move about safely, uh, that they can get to places where they're safe, uh, and uh, that, uh, again, we can make sure that not only is Zaid flowing in, but those who are responsible for distributing get in. The right structures can be built to make sure that people can benefit from it. So we're focused on this, um, and we'll continue the work that we're doing together uh, with our partners to make sure that that assistance can get there. Thank you, Tony. Uh, well, as it relates to the, the issue of a ceasefire, it is our position that the ceasefire is imperative to deal with the consequences, the humanitarian consequences of this uh, conflict. And we believe that dealing with the various uh, components of this crisis uh, should be dealt with uh, as well in an appropriate manner. But it is the international community's responsibility always to seek the cessation of hostilities, not to, to promote the continuance of uh, violence, uh, military activity that has a very uh, dire impact on the well-being of the civilian population in a very restricted area, uh, and, uh, which uh, has specific and special characteristics uh, like Gaza. As uh, for the issue of the future of Gaza, I believe that this is a premature at this time. We have to concentrate on the subject at hand, whether it be the cessation of hostilities, addressing the humanitarian needs of the people of Gaza, uh, addressing the uh, issues of uh, displacement and, and the provision of, of safety for, for the civilians, uh, and addressing the overall context uh, of the conflict. Uh, I believe that uh, at this stage, these, those are the issues that uh, we need to concentrate on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're focused right now on, on stopping this war, stopping the, the destruction it's causing, stopping the killing that it's causing. What happens next? How can we even entertain uh, uh, what will happen in Gaza when we do not know what kind of Gaza will be left after this war? Uh, are we going to be talking about the wasteland? Are we going to be talking about a whole population reduced to refugees? Simply, uh, we, do not know, we do not have all the variables to even start thinking about that. Uh, I think 
we need to focus now on stopping this war, so at least we have a, a, a we start even to begin to imagine the kind of visible reality that will exist there. And after that, let me just be very, very clear. Gaza alone will just not cut it. We've been through security uh, treatment of the conflict before. Where did it lead us? The only way going forward to achieve what we all want, which is a just and lasting peace that protects the rights of all, is to look at the comprehensive conflict, uh, look about bringing the two-state solution back and, and realize it as soon as possible, convincing the Palestinians that they have a future, and, uh, and, and again, creating uh, conditions uh, uh, different from, from the miserable conditions of despair and, and anger and, 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 and hatred and, and, and occupation uh, in which the, this is just a, a, a cycle of violence erupted. So I think we need to get our priorities straight. Right now, we have to make sure the war stops. Right now, we have to make sure that we bring in sufficient, uh, if enough, food and water and medicine and fuel to Gazans because with every minute of delay, uh, a child or a woman or a little girl is dying because they don't have access to these, to these uh, basic services. So after that, uh, again, we have to look at the comprehensive picture. We have to make sure that we do not contribute to creating the same conditions that in which uh, this violence erupted. And I think we are all committed uh, to working together on that. As we always say, the United States is the leading role. We need that role. Uh, the rest of us will have to do our our part as well. Everybody will have to do their part again to make sure that uh, we bring uh, security and peace to, uh, to, to the Palestinians and the Israelis. Al Mamlaka TV. Your Excellency, Mr. Blinken, why don't doesn't Washington exert pressure on Tel Aviv? to seize the, the uh, war and uh, s uh, stop it and allow for, uh, and allow for uh, delivery of humanitarian aid after all what happened. Thank you. Uh, we are intensely focused on the delivery of humanitarian aid. Uh, we are intensely focused on the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Um, on my last trip to the region, I spent considerable time with the Israeli government, and then in consultation with um, the uh, Egyptian government, the United Nations, on establishing uh, a channel to make sure that we could get assistance into people who needed it in Gaza. And as I mentioned a short while ago, uh, whereas uh, just a little over a week ago, nothing was getting in. We had zero trucks moving in. Today, I think we had 105 trucks uh, move in uh, to uh, Gaza with essential needs for people. But as I also say, and as we all agree, that is not nearly enough. So what we're working on now is expanding uh, that access, making sure that more is getting to people who need it, and that we have the structure in place to be able to, uh, to absorb it, to, uh, to use it, uh, distribute it effectively. Um, this is exactly what we're doing. Uh, when I was in Israel yesterday, this was a big focus of my conversation with the Israeli government. Um, and it's also, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why we think it would be important uh, to have humanitarian pauses. That would further facilitate the ability to deliver aid and not only to deliver aid, again, to expand uh, the aid that we're delivering. So uh, we're, we're looking to that. Uh, we agreed with um, the government of Israel yesterday uh, to look at how that uh, might happen. There are a lot of questions that have to be answered about how to make that work. So we're focused on, on doing that. But again, we have been intensely focused on getting humanitarian assistance to people who need it in Gaza. Last question. Tamar Smadi, from Al Jazeera. Tamar Smadi from Al Jazeera channel. Tamar Smadi, Al Jazeera. My question to Mr. Blinken. After around one month of the Israeli war on Gaza, what are the results that Israel has achieved except killing uh, around 10,000 civilians, most of them children and women? What are the results that Israel has achieved? And what is the number of victims uh, 
exactly of civilians that would make the United States to stop and think and look at this open massacre and to ask Israel decisively to stop this bloodshed in the Gaza Strip. What took place on October 7th defies almost the human ability to digest or describe. And I think for many, that day has receded in their minds and in their consciousness. But I can say this and I'll say it again. Not a single one of the countries represented here or that met together today, or for that matter, pretty much any country in the world, would simply accept the slaughter of its citizens and do nothing about it. So, we maintain again that Israel has a right and indeed an obligation to defend itself uh, and to try to take the steps necessary to ensure that what happened on October 7th never happens again. But equally, it is very important how Israel does this. And in particular, it's important to take every possible measure to protect civilians and to prevent harm to them, as well as to ensure that those who need assistance get it. And in our conversations with the Israeli government, uh, including uh, just yesterday, uh, we have pointed to steps that they could and should take to minimize harm to civilians, to prevent civilian casualties. Now, this is also an extraordinary challenge. Hamas cynically, monstrously, embeds itself in the midst of civilians puts its fighters, its commanders, its weapons, its ammunition, its command and control in residential buildings, under schools and in schools, under hospitals and in hospitals, under mosques and in mosques. Monsters. But nonetheless, Israel has an obligation to abide by the laws of war, humanitarian law, and to do everything possible to prevent civilian casualties. And this is very much part of what we're saying to the Israeli government and what I said again yesterday. At the same time, providing humanitarian assistance to those in need, making sure that men, women, and children in Gaza are cared for, this is also an intense focus of our actions, including with the Israeli government. Thank you. And uh, at the talk, I just want to reaffirm once again that we're going to continue to work together, uh, bridge whatever gaps we have in our position, because ultimately we want the same thing. But again, I just want to say uh, one thing. Imagine you're a Palestinian father, mother. You have to leave your, your, your home and the already miserable existence of a refugee camp in Gaza. You take your kids to the south. You take shelter in a hospital. And you're looking at your eye, at the eyes of your children, and you know you cannot protect them. Uh, you know that you cannot find a place where they can escape the bombing. How do you explain to these uh, that this is helpless? How do you explain to our father, whom we saw in CNN yesterday, in the rubble, looking for four children of his that are still buried in the rubble and he cannot, he cannot find them? I think we need to remind each other of our humanity. Uh, I think we need to uh, accept that uh, Killing more people will not bring those who are lost on both sides as tragic as the loss is. I think we need to all emphasize that everything we can do to save one more life is imperative upon all of us. I don't want to go into characterization of what the international law says about that or what the international law says about this. But I would say what we all as human beings, as you said, as Thomas said, as we all say, as human beings, we just cannot accept to see all that killing unfolding, to see all that reduction of life to, to a complete loss. How is, how, how can we justify to anybody that killing 9,000 people, killing 3,700 children, uh, destroying 150,000 houses, killing, destroying hospitals, how can we justify that, that this is self-defense? 
I think let's let's back to the basic. Let's step back and, and take a pause. And again, we all understand the pain, but we are this world is going to produce more pain for Palestinians or Israelis, and this is going to push us all again into the abyss of hatred and dehumanization that will make killing even more more acceptable. So that needs to stop. That's our priority. It has to stop now. It has to, to end. And we should all work for our future. When a Palestinian child sees an Israeli child, they see in each other a potential friend, not a future enemy. I, I think that's what we need to do. And I look forward to working with all our colleagues and friends here to create that reality and just once and for all uh, end the need for war and the need for violence and, and end conditions in which only misery and, 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 and an environment that, that enables the kind of reason that produces the and smarting also on the side of Israel that, that produces. Thank you.